afternoon and welcome to today's webinar, Protect Your Plant Floor Assets with an OT Cybersecurity Strategy. My name is Andrea Corona and I am the Senior Editor for Pharma Manufacturing Magazine, which is producing this event, and this event is sponsored by Drago. Today, we'll be discussing how to create and manage a comprehensive operations technology cybersecurity strategy. But before we get started with today's webinar, there are a few housekeeping items I need to review. By now, most of you have probably been through a webinar or two. Uh, and fortunately, the interface for the platform we're using is quite straightforward. You should see six different boxes, each of which can be maximized or minimized for convenient interaction. If you minimize any of them, you can restore it using one of the icons on the bottom of the screen. In the center is the window where today's presentation will take place. Under that, you will see a group chat box where you can exchange messages with any fellow attendees. Immediately to the left is the Ask a Question dialog box, where I'd encourage you to submit questions to our presenters today, and we'll have some time at the end of the formal portion of the presentation and discussion today to answer those questions. Also, if you're having any technical difficulties, you can ask those questions there, and one of our techs will help you out. Underneath that, there's the ability to share what's happening via social media, as well as a box with your audio controls. If you move over to the right, there's a box where you can download the presentation slides and any other related content. This webinar will be archived on the Pharma Manufacturing website, and we encourage you to direct it to coworkers to the recorded presentation. Finally, at the end of the presentation, please stay tuned for a very brief survey that will give us the feedback we need to improve our future webinars. All that aside, without further ado, I'd like to introduce today's speakers, who you are seeing on your screen right now. Um, joining us today, we have Nick Shaw, Seth Lacey, and Dan Scaley. Nick Shaw is an adversary adversary solution architect focused on industrial cybersecurity for Dragos. Over the past decade, he has assessed, designed, and implemented industrial control systems and the infrastructure that connects them. Seth Lacey is a principal adversary hunter on the Dragos intelligence team. He draws in 12 years of government and commercial experience across a number of cybersecurity functions to hunt innovative adversary tactics, techniques, and procedures to inform the defense of operational technology networks, within industrial infrastructures. Finally, Dan Scaley is a Senior Director of Strategy at Drago. He has dedicated his career to improving industrial cybersecurity outcomes by spearheading the secure development of industrial software, advising the owners and operators of industrial facilities on managing digital, digital risks, and helping the ICS OT cybersecurity community improve its ability to detect and respond to threats in industrial environments. It's safe to say they're the experts, so I feel like I should pass the floor on to them. Thank you so much for joining us today, um, and enjoy the presentation, everyone. Great, thanks, Andrea. So, so let's get started. Um, first, since we're all from Dragos, um, just a quick overview of uh, who Dragos is. So we are an operational technology and industrial control systems focused cybersecurity company. So not so much focused on the IT side as much as more of the manufacturing and technical operations. And so at the center of what we do um, is a technology called the Dragos platform, which can show you what you have on a manufacturing network, what the potential cybersecurity threats are, and then what to do about them. Um, but surrounding that and strengthening the technology um, are the, the human intelligence uh, capabilities that we have. Around our threat intel team that is out looking at you know how uh, cybersecurity breaches and incidents are happening uh, in the industrial space, what the vulnerabilities are, um, things uh, also that we do around our services. So when we go in uh, and do assessments for customers, understanding you know what their weaknesses are and challenges they're having, and then of course the community. So we talk a lot with our customers, some of whom opt in to share uh, information with us about their cybersecurity challenges and the things that they're seeing uh, in their environment. And so a lot of the information that we're sharing today is coming from these experiences uh, from, from our team um, and also our technology. So just kind of set the stage here, uh, in April, the National Association of Manufacturers uh, surveyed their membership around cybersecurity risk. Uh, and it's safe to say that manufacturers um, in general were, were not sure if they're doing enough or addressing um, all of the cybersecurity challenges that they have. So just 19% felt that they had a fully formed cybersecurity program. 
uh, just 57% felt like um, that their company's plant floor systems and assets were, you know, uh, well, were actually, uh, were partially secure. So, sorry, 57% felt that they were partially secure. So the majority was feeling like uh, they weren't really adequately, adequately protected. Um, so you're really in kind of setting the stage here. Um, the question is, you know, what are the threats as a baseline? What do um, manufacturers or pharmaceutical manufacturers in particular um, have to be uh, worried about uh, in developing a cybersecurity program? And so I'll turn it over to you, Seth, to uh, answer that question. Absolutely. So, you know, the statistics are kind of helpful in uh, scoping the threat, but don't really put much context around it. And uh, help us answer, you know, why does this matter? And how can we frame the risks in not getting OT cybersecurity right? So uh, to kind of lead off uh, that conversation, I'd like to touch on a few of the threat groups that we track that have historically or are currently uh, targeting the pharmaceutical vertical. Uh, the first of those is Erythrite uh, that focuses on search engine optimization poisoning, credential stealing, um, and functions as a bit of an access broker. So essentially they uh, compromise companies and then sell off their access to the higher bidded, highest bidder uh, for whatever follow on malicious activities they'd like to undertake. Uh, one thing that's kind of interesting about this threat is they rapidly evolve their malware uh, to avoid detection. And so this is a good example of you know, limitations on even fresh indicators of compromise when you've got an adversary that's intent on evading detection. Another interesting thing about Erythrite is no clear indications of nation state sponsorship. You know, historically in the industrial uh, space, we've mainly seen adversaries with some kind of nation state sponsorship, but Erythrite has no nation state sponsorship that, that we've been able to identify, but has still managed to reach stage two of the ICS kill chain, which simply means that they've found their way into operational technology networks uh, the next third group I'd like to touch on is Venatonite. Uh, they focus on compromising uh, vulnerable public facing services for information gathering and initial access. So they're using mainly publicly known vulnerabilities. And this is kind of an interesting point in, in that you know, th these aren't really sexy new zero day vulnerabilities. It's things that are known, but just haven't been patched yet. Uh, and their main interest is in information gathering at this time, as opposed to any kind of purposefully destructive activity. They've only reached stage one of the ICS kill chain, which means they have a clear pattern of targeting uh, industrial net or like industrial companies, but haven't made it over uh, off of the IT side of the network into the operational technology side of the network. Venatonite has uh, technical overlaps to groups that are tracked by the rest of the community as APT41 and kind of the broader WinT cluster. Uh, and the last threat group I'd like to touch on is Wasanite. Uh, very similar to Venatonite, IT compromise, information gathering, stage one of the ICS kill chain. Uh, but one of their kind of interesting variations is they deploy really environment specific malware variants. Um, they will build out malware variants that are tailored to a specific network. And part of that capability we've seen is uh, proxying across network segmentation. So building on a specific variant that will uh, take advantage of uh, internal IP addresses and proxy uh, communications from an internal portion of the network back out to the internet. Uh, our assessment is that Wasanite maintains technical, technical overlaps to groups that are attributed to North Korea, uh, particularly the Kim Saki cluster. So that kind of leads into the next section on campaigns and adversary activity more broadly, uh, kind of moving away from threat groups specifically and more just what kind of activity are we seeing uh, across, across the board. And so touching on North Korea, one of the themes we've been watching is uh, there's an increase in interest in medical and pharmaceutical targets, mostly as a result of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And so while intellectual property has always been of interest to a lot of these threat groups, it opened you know, the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, the interest around vaccines really opened the door to the prospect of great power competition uh, impacting the pharmaceutical industry uh, in the cyber domain. 
kind of as an aside, the interesting thing is this wouldn't be the first time that's happened. Uh, I'm kind of referring to the incident in 2017 uh, with NotPetya at Merck, which was kind of in the same vein. It was just less targeted and Merck ended up being uh, a bit more of collateral damage. Um, so, you know, I think I would be remiss not to touch on ransomware. So if I could go ahead and get the next slide. You know, it's unfortunately hard to ignore state sponsored or not. Uh, one thing that we've been noting is the trend of ransomware strains incorporating OT and ICS related processes in their process kill lists. So the first example of this was ECANS. Um, and one of their first victims was Fresenius Cabby uh, back in 2020. And so we're aware of six total strains at this point with uh, ICS specific processes in their process kill lists, uh, which are CLOP, Megacortex, Netfilm, LockerGoga, and Maze uh, in, addition, in addition to ECANs. So one thing that's kind of interesting about this is with the process kill functionality, it's mainly designed to remove file locks from sensitive items. So you're talking license keys and data stores, and the ransomware actors here are kind of just trying to extend the impact of the ransomware event by encrypting these vital files. So it's concerning, but it's also important to differentiate from modifications to an industrial process to produce a potential physical disruption that you see with some of the more advanced actors in the OT and ICS space. Um, so this blunt kind of indiscriminate process termination can understandably lead to unintended side effects in production environments and ultimately lead to disruptions to operations. So I think kind of our takeaway at this point on ransomware is that while it might not be the most interesting or uh, sophisticated in terms of adversary activity, um, it's certainly the area where we've seen kind of the highest density of impacts on operations. You know, these ransomware groups want to have an impact to induce payment. They really don't care about the damage they might cause along the way. So kind of like using this to set the stage, it becomes pretty clear why OT cybersecurity is an important focus area. But that doesn't make it easier, right? How do we bridge the acknowledge gap between information technology professionals and operational technology professionals? How do we share knowledge across those two domains that, that is absolutely critical to combat this threat to prevent and prepare for uh, potential bad days? Uh, and so with that, I'll go ahead and hand it over to Nick to talk about some strategies for uh, how you can try to um, bring these these two parts of the business together and make sure uh, that everybody is kind of rowing in the same direction. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Seth. So as Seth said, um, getting started on this journey is no easy task. There's lots to do. It can be very complex. So let's start with three keys to a successful uh, operation technology cybersecurity journey. And the first one is really building that foundation with an executive alignment. Um, I've worked with customers where, you know, individual teams have tried to do something um, to redress risk with their facilities. Um, and, and that's all been like, really good efforts. And it's really great that they want to be proactive to try and do that. Um, but what I've seen when that occurs is that when you build a cybersecurity strategy from the bottom up, um, those teams or individuals tr typically will address the problem with the resources they have versus the possible resources that they can get from an executive alignment. So when you look at what actually comes out of that, um, the efforts that they produce aren't really um, resourced and uh, correctly funded. So you try to bolt on different technologies, different solutions to, to try and address some of that risk and protect yourself. Um, but when you start getting executive alignment, that's where you can get some scale out of the standards that you're putting in place and those policies and procedures for the various controls that we're going to dive into in a couple. Um, but really that responsibility comes top down from leadership to really fund and resource to really drive that strategic approach. You fund resources uh, under people um, to get more resources to help address these problems. And also you drive some strategy between overall policies, procedures, what's our standards, what are we actually gonna implement? So then you look at prioritization. Um, you know, I work with a bunch of different pharmaceutical companies that are multi-site, multinational across the globe. Um, so really, when you look at prioritization, uh, coming up with a roadmap of how you're going to actually roll out an OT cybersecurity plan um, that is directional in nature. You can evaluate that on a yearly basis because, as Seth talked about, 
Um, adversaries change. Um, they change over time. The tactics techniques used usually don't, but there are new adversaries, there are new threats. Um, so making sure that that roadmap that you can adapt and prioritize the various controls and needs out of that is extremely, um, extremely necessary. So when you look at the roadmap and how you prioritize things, obviously you want to align those with business objectives and then help with communicating those cost benefits of various projects and the different improvements that you could target. Um, really looking at it and understanding the risk and impact of what does a bad day look like for you. Um, you can look at subsets of facilities, business units within your organization um, to really answer that question. Um, you know, working with a multinational, we were looking at, okay, if this facility over in Europe were to go down, that actually affects 85% of the US's insulin. Obviously that's a really critical facility that they wanted to target and protect first. So then you come up with prioritization between what's your biggest boom factor for sites to kind of group those sites to start here first versus trying to address 40, 80, hundreds of sites across the world. And then of course, collaboration between IT and OT. Um, you know, As we've seen the age old time of marriage counseling between IT and OT, there's different languages that are spoken. Um, and, and the two groups, uh, it, it is much more successful if they are working together um, at the people and technology level to so try and standardize on what we're trying to actually roll out for a strategy. Um, so two different mindsets to focus on. Obviously, there's complications by various factors such as OEMs on the OT side. Um, you know, what does a, a vendor that you're supporting for your operations um, allow you to do when it comes to connectivity and support and getting telemetry out of those different devices? And we'll dive into that in a couple more slides. Um, but what's the risk tolerance for operations? Um, you know, how does it affect the product that I'm actually producing and selling to market? Um, and then, you know, just the idea of the other side doesn't really know or have the experience to make the right decisions. Um, there are third parties and partnerships that you can have to help bridge those gaps, as Seth said, uh, to work on IT and OT and really help prioritize. Um, it's really tough to find resources that do it all. Um, you know, it's rare to find somebody that knows the operations side that is extremely strong in IT and security. Um, but finding those resources that are really focused on ICS and then bolting on security on top of it is where I found a lot of success uh, of getting resources to help your organization. So really um, where I've seen some good advancements is finding the idea of a cross-functional team. You have stakeholders from not only IT and OT, but also from quality, um, especially pharmaceutical. I've seen where qualities come to the table and had conversations on how operational impact affects, you know, validation of a line when you're looking at change and how it can affect the final product that you're bringing to market. Um, so there certainly is um, more to bring to the table in that cross-functional team other than just IT and OT. So really leveraging that third party possibly as a partnership to help you bridge some of those gaps is important as well. Yeah, Nick, you preempted my question. I was actually curious about quality's role in all this as well. So uh, thanks for that, that overview. Um, so, uh, you know, Nick, you've kind of covered once you've got everybody to the table and you've got everybody, you know, agreeing um, that you need to do something about um, industrial cybersecurity or cybersecurity focus on the manufacturing floor. I guess the question is really like, you know, what do you do next? Um, and so I'll just share um, as an intro here, uh, the five critical controls that Dragos has defined and uh, one of the resources that I think we have attached to the webinar is our white paper um, about these five critical controls. And we'll, we'll spend the rest of the session um, kind of diving into uh, each of these controls um, individually and having a discussion around it and also asking you all in the audience um, for some of your input, which hopefully you're, you're willing to, to give to help us kind of tailor our, our comments a bit. But my, my question, Nick, would be, you know, why these five controls and kind of, uh, you know, how, how did this all come about? Yeah, great question, Dan. So if you look at a lot of the service engagements and incidents that our incident responders have been responding to, um, often we find that customers are missing the most foundational of controls. Um, so if you look at what's listed here, and we'll dive into the details on each one, um, these are foundational controls at, at their best, um, the most reasonable place to start. And really, when you look at all you can be doing, it's very complex, and, and there's lots to do. So starting with five um, you know, critical controls is where we put a lot of emphasis. Um, and it really looks to answer a couple challenges. Um, the first one is really how to get data and the, really the telemetry out of an OT environment to start doing something with it. So if you look at the various controls, incident response plan and those policies procedures, tell you what to do with the data. When you see something, an alert or a vulnerability, what do you actually do with it? Because that is the, the next question once you actually get the data. I get the data, see what I have in the, the plant floor. 
And then what do I actually do with it and how do I respond to it? So these are the five critical controls that we usually talk to our customers to start on their OT cybersecurity journey. And if you look through them, um, I wanna emphasize that we look at really three categories too. Um, and really these things are wrapped around people, processes and technology. Cool, thanks Nick, that's super helpful. So that, that'll actually bring us to our first poll question. Um, so the first um, control is about having uh, an ICS specific incident response plan. So we're curious to know from the audience, just you know, where you are um, along um, your, your journey uh, with an ICS specific um, incident response plan. So we're eager to get just a few responses if, uh, if you wouldn't mind uh, plugging into the poll. I know Nick, Seth, you have any guesses on, on, on what you think is going to come out uh, on top here amongst uh, yes, no, and we're working on it? You know, I think I'm going to go with you, know, we're working on it. Uh, I think there's an increasing uh, awareness that this is an important step to take and, and that uh, there needs to be a level of preparedness going into an incident because uh, if there's not, uh, there's really no plan to deal with it. Um, but I'll definitely be curious to see how the responses shake out. How about you, Nick? We're, we're almost there. I think we've got almost a, a quorum, but do you have any thoughts? Yeah, no, I, yeah, I think I agree with Seth. I think, you know, it, it's a journey. Um, talk about the destination of the journey. Uh, cybersecurity plans are always changing. Adversaries and threats are always changing. So um, I think looking at foundational controls, even the ones that we're going to talk about today, um, you know, those are multi-year things that you try to implement and get coverage at your facilities. Cool. Well, thank you everybody who, who responded. And so, yeah, the majority is uh, we're working on it. So about 67% there. Um, and then about a quarter uh, that do have an ICS a specific incident response plan. So, so let's talk about um, a little bit about that control, you know, and, and so I'd like to hear um, from uh, from Yousef on you know well what is an ICS specific incident response plan you know why is it needed uh, and and what are some of the benefits? Yeah, so you know kind of in terms of what is an ICS specific incident response plan and why is it needed? You know, surprising no one here, OT environments are just inherently different, right? So investigation is requiring a different set of tools and languages managing the potential impact of an incident is going to be subtly different for every industry and across all industries complicated by the availability requirements that are inherent to OT. Um, and so a lot of the incident response uh, techniques and procedures that might work within an IT environment just aren't going to be applicable within an OT environment, be it these uh, different uh, languages and protocols or uh, those availability requirements that are that are just at the heart of OT uh, uh, environments. So the other piece of this is that what triggers an uh, operational technology incident response plan may be different than that for an IT network. And it's really important to have those triggers clearly defined and the roles and responsibilities across OT security, IT security and leadership explicitly outlined if you ever observe any of those triggers. And so I, I want to touch on a couple quick examples here. Um, speaking about the Trisis uh, Triton incident uh, and the uh, incident at the German steel mill in 2014, in both of those examples, uh, there were signs that there was something wrong uh, within the OT network. Uh, prior to the incident itself. Uh, and in both cases, uh, they were initially um, written off as just uh, a mechanical malfunction, right? No no real consideration that, that cyber could have uh, been playing a role. And so that's why I kind of touch on this idea of having these triggers clearly defined and a plan for if these triggers are observed, um, what are your next steps? How do you respond uh, when you observe those triggers in your environment? Because you know, in both of those cases, you know, it's, it's impossible to say in retrospect whether uh, they could have gotten in front of the adversary, but a lot of this is giving yourself the best opportunity to get in front of the adversary. And so having those triggers in place, having uh, 
your your plan explicitly laid out um, allows you to get as far in front of that and give yourself the most opportunities for detection and remedi remediation that you possibly can. And so uh, kind of on that same note, tabletop exercises, right? They're incredibly important so that the first time the plan's activated isn't the first time people are thinking about how to execute it smoothly, right? So this is especially critical when you're talking about these interconnects between the different teams and different levels of leadership. And so, you know, I think kind of those things in summation uh, illustrate just why it is so critical to have a separate ICS specific incident response plan outside of uh, your incident response approach for IT networks. Yeah, that's interesting. Thanks, Seth. And I guess I would ask um, for, for Seth or, or for Nick, I mean, whether it's in the plan or whether it's a scenario for a tabletop, I mean, what, what are some of the types of things that you would, um, I guess, recommend uh, that, that a pharmaceutical um, company include as, you know, scenarios to, to be thinking about? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think touching back on kind of the, the threat landscape in that conversation, I think thinking through the scenario of what happens if uh, ransomware uh, jumps your segmentation or is purpose purposefully moved across from your IT network to your OT network, but also kind of how do you respond if you have a ransomware incident on the IT side of the network? What does that mean uh, for your OT network? And how can you deal with containing uh, that ransomware incident while still maintaining the continuity of your, your OT operations, right? Because you, unfortunately, ransomware is where we've seen the, the most impacts, right? And a lot of times it's these unexpected interconnects between IT and OT that result in ransomware incidents, whether they make it into the OT network or not, having an impact on operations. Um, and so you, it's not the most interesting of examples, but I think it is uh, one of the most realistic for what we're seeing in the environment today. Yeah, that makes, yeah. Sense. makes sense. I know it's top of mind. Yeah, one of the things I was going to expand on there too, and I think one of the things that's most often overlooked is like the communication plan too. So when something mm -hmm. like, like Seth described, if you have an impact on the IT, you're running around pants on fire, who do you call on the OT side to see if there is an operational impact and it does affect the product you're making? Um, working with a couple of customers right now to help define their policies and procedures and workflows of you have to communicate to this head of the business unit uh, for this certain product line that's being made or, you know, what's your contacts at the local site? Um, you know, if something were to traverse the environment and make a change to a PLC's program, um, you know, that could trigger a validation of going through and having to do a bunch of documentation to validate that whatever happened from the incident didn't actually modify the control system to affect the quality of what you're shipping. Um, so those different types of things of just going through those communications and planning those things ahead of time. So when you have your worst day, because eventually there will be a worst day for most organizations, it's not a matter of if, it's when. Um, you have those things documented, ready to go, and you know it makes it a little bit easier. I'll hold up, hold up air quotes, but easier to be able to respond in the heat of the moment. Sounds good. Well, let's keep things moving. So our, our next um, poll question um, is around if your organization has a controls, automation, and infrastructure standard. So um, interested to hear, you know, again, where you are um, on your journey, uh, if, if you don't mind sharing, um, you know, is it something you've, you've iterated on, um, something you're working on, haven't started, um, in terms of, you know, defining, um, you know, that uh, controls automation and, and infrastructure. And you know, this is kind of a lead into the second control that we'll talk about, um, which is um, around uh, having a defensible architecture. And so we'll talk a little bit about, you know, what that, what that means. Getting a few responses coming in. I'll wait just a little bit more before kind of flipping the page here. All right, great. So, um, so if we go there, you know, again, uh, a little more of uh, we're working on it being the top response. So uh, makes sense. And I think that is actually a good segue to kind of uh, dig into uh, what is a defensible architecture and what would a what would a good standard look like? So maybe Nick, you can kind of describe 
what we mean by defensible architecture um, and you know why it's important and, and how to build it. Yeah, absolutely, Dan. So you know, as control systems have evolved over time, of course, we changed network mediums and capabilities. Control systems started off serial-based communications had moved to Ethernet. And really, as Ethernet was adopted, systems were either connected to existing networks in facilities. Sometimes those were business user networks um, that would you know, support the front office um, or just new islands of automation networks within the plant floor. Um, so really, as over time and that connectivity increased, uh, specific OT standards weren't really considered um, for how we can connect those machines and those devices to the environment uh, to keep those protected and keep those available and up and, up and running. Um, so there's lots of reference architectures out there, um, and those align to the Purdue Enterprise reference architecture. So you can figure out how do I segment my environment, how do I protect IT from OT, vice versa, but still um, meet the needs of availability from the plant floor. Um, so when you look at um, removing the, the extra OT network access points from the environment, you want to really define strong IT, OT boundaries. Um, you know, those can include a DMZ. Usually those things are physically segmented with a firewall in between and you've got very specific rules of the different applications that can communicate between the plant floor and the IT environment. So whether you're logging information about batches or lots of products you're making, um, you know, obviously there's still business reasons why we want connectivity, but we want to do it in a secure manner. Um, so really when you look at the organization need, um, developing like a network standard, it's really just as important as an automation standard. Changes the behavior of how you actually go procure equipment from various vendors and OEMs. Um, when you provide a standard of this is how I want you to build this machine for connectivity and for getting that data out of it that's important in my business, but we want to do it to make sure we're meeting the standards and specifications that we've put in place for various segmentation and other controls. Um, so really that helps um, you know, define how I can secure my assets, secure my devices, but it also enables things like secure remote access um, and really how can we get remote maintenance supporting our facility when we're strapped on resources and, and people. So if we look at you know, developing the right policies and procedures for defining standard networks, uh, for configuration, segmentation strategy, um, we really need to figure out like what is the process for um, the people to really maintain that piece of equipment and maintain that network. How often do we go and refresh things, address vulnerabilities, which we'll talk about in a little more depth in a couple slides, um, but really it starts with that separate um, you know, ITOT boundary and then you know, some dedicated services for the OT side. Um, you know, when you talk about availability of a plant floor environment, um, you know, shared resources, if I were to rip the cable out in an incident, for example, and then you know, have my um, you know, system shut down because I'm using shared resources, I look to stand up different things in the OT domain that can function if a disconnect were to occur. Things like domain services, if I've got patching services, um, you know, things that, that supply remote access, stuff like that. Um, you know, those things are critical for my OT environment that I need to keep up and running if I were to disconnect and the, the um, incident um, were to occur. So then I can start to identify um, and, and really migrate assets from those legacy networks, from the IT network, if they are on the same one, and really um, give priority to the ones that I want to collect data from to add further mitigating controls to protect. Um, you know, as we know, in OT environments, there are legacy equipments out there. Um, you know, some organizations have like an N minus one policy for how they look at operating systems that support process controls. Um, but, you know, all, uh, not all the time can you actually migrate away from like a Windows 7 the next day, right? Microsoft says we're stopped supporting this, stop releasing uh, patches. Um, we can't just migrate away from that. So how do we come up with different mitigating controls within that architecture that we can standardize on? So when we're looking at the design of defensible architecture, really we want to design that with telemetry and logging in mind, because if I can't get the data out to see what's going on within there, which we'll talk about on the next control, um, you know, it's all well and good to connect it. But if I want to go troubleshoot something or see what occurred, um, diving into an incident, that logging and telemetry is extremely important for figuring out what happened if a threat were to occur. Great. Thanks, Nick. So let's keep things moving along um, through the last uh, three controls. And, and we promise this is the last question and, and thanks for the great participation so far. But how much visibility do you have within uh, your OT environment? And so um, we gave a couple options here of, you know, completely covered. I've got, you know, everything, um, you know, down to 25% or, or no visibility. Um, so interested to get, um, responses about how much visibility and understanding, you know, do you have of, of what's on your OT network? I, I think this is going to be 
A tricky one, it typically requires either, you know, walking down the plant and hoping nothing changes since last time you walked it down, right? Or uh, deploying some technology or something like that. Um, and so I think, um, you know, given the, the complexity of the, of, of the problem, although it is very, very solvable, uh, I think we'll probably, I would guess we'll be in the none to 50%, but I'm curious. I know Nick, Seth, what do you, what do you guys think? Yeah, I, I yeah. think it's probably going to be on the lower end of percentage. Um, you know, achieving visibility takes time. Like I said, when you're looking at your facilities and your install base and the footprint of what you have for a lot of these large organizations in pharma, um, you know, nobody is at 100%. There's always an island of automation. There's always an island of, of some network that is sitting in a dark corner that, um, as Rob Lee would say, you know, find the crustiest controls guy in the facility and he'll go show you something that people didn't know existed. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm guessing less than 50%. Yeah, that's a great point. And we talked about prioritization earlier, right? So it's like getting to hundred percent is uh, difficult, expensive, you know, potentially, right? And so just kind of picking the most important places, I would, I would expect that, you know, maybe a hundred percent is a, is a goal, but maybe a place that not everybody gets to. Um, so let's see. All right. Well, we got 75% being the top, so that's that's a really good, um, uh, really good percentage to have more than half or really two thirds, right, of folks that had uh, at least 75% coverage. Um, so I'm curious, maybe during the Q and A or as we kind of progress our discussion, um, you know, thoughts on that getting that last 25% and, uh, you know, if it's just a work in progress or if there's a decision that it wasn't worth it. Um, and, and also getting your thoughts, um, Nick and Seth, as, as we keep going. So um, so, so the third control uh, around OT visibility. Uh, so I think, you know, as we discussed the, the poll, um, we, we kind of covered what we uh, would define this as, but if you can just give your thoughts, Nick, on, kind of, you know, why, why is it important um, you know, how to do it and, um, and what is a good, you know, OT visibility program or capability look like? Yeah, absolutely. And I'll just reiterate the, the one quote that's on the top of the slide. You can't protect what you can't see. Um, you really need to know what assets are in the environment. How are those assets communicating amongst themselves? What is the expected activity between PLCs, engineering workstations, you know, operator terminals, like everything that's in and connected to do a control system? Um, really having that comprehensive asset inventory and having some key attributes on each asset. Um, when you look at a controller, you've got make model version of firmware and you've got that for multiple cards within a controller. Um, so that's where OT differs where these module devices that can have vulnerabilities per card um, in these assets. So if you look at um, you know the expected communications, the interaction between devices, you can start to identify patterns and then you can tell when things go awry. Um, you know, as some of the threats that Seth talked about, um, you know, identifying what is the base behavior, but also looking at the various tactics, techniques, and toolkits that um, some of these adversaries use, we can figure out what's in the facility. Um, is it functioning as intended or is it deviating from its intended configuration? I mean, then once you have some of those key attributes as make model version of firmware, you can actually map vulnerabilities against those assets. Um, and that's something that, you know, when we talk about key vulnerability management in, in the, one of the next few controls, um, you know, having those three key attributes of model, firmware, and the vendor, um, you can actually figure out what mitigating controls can I put in place. And of course, we'll talk about differences for OT vulnerability management. Um, but then also looking at that traffic um, for potential threats, you know, as Seth talked about um, the various threat activity groups and, and looking at um, the different tooling that they might use, um, monitoring that traffic and be able to detect things early, um, you know, helps mitigate the risk uh, when it comes to impact on an environment. And then of course, you know, when I do have those uh, standards, policies, procedures for how I implement my control systems and the networks associated with them, are those controls functioning as intended for my defensible architecture? Um, if I'm not monitoring the traffic, if I'm not looking at what's going on, um, you know, I can make assumptions of what's occurring in my environment, but I can't really confirm. So sometimes monitoring will help you just confirm assumptions that you have. Um, you know, when it comes to OT environments and pharmaceutical, you know, I've seen where vulnerability scanners are expected to not be scanning within the OT environment, and you put a monitoring solution in place, and all of a sudden you're finding out why the controller is tipping over at 2 a.m. every Saturday. Um, you know, I had some assumptions that I've got protective controls in place, my firewall is configured as intended and not allowing that activity, 
but then you know i find out that it actually is and it's scanning a large amount of my controls network and possibly disrupting operations so in 2021 um our service customers uh we determined 86 percent of them had no visibility in their ot environments so that's uh, no monitoring in place um, no forming of those asset inventories automatically, um, you know, listening to the traffic in the environments, um, but also no centralized logging. Uh, when you talk about incident response and diving into um, what occurred and, and are you still compromised and are you still having an issue, that logging and central data collection point is extremely key to act almost like um, the black box that's c capturing all the data from the airplane flying, right? You've got your operations going over time, um, logging everything that's going on. And so you can look back to see what happened in the case of a disaster. Cool. Thanks, Nick. Um, so why don't we, when we speed through, which I think are a bit more uh, than, than the first three. So the fourth control is multi-factor authentication. Um, and so maybe Seth, you can walk us through uh, what that is and why that's important. Yeah, so multi-factor authentication is kind of an interesting one because you know we've talked a lot about you know, OT networks being different and unique. And multi-factor authentication is one example of a pretty standard IT control that if applied appropriately can be used in an OT uh, context. And so, um, you know, one of the trends of the COVID era, I think, was uh, this increasing push toward uh, remote access, right? And and that was kind of true across uh, organizations of all sizes during the pandemic. And so, you know, multi-factor authentication isn't going to be appropriate in all contexts, uh, but for for an operational technology network, having multi-factor authentication for any type of remote access into that uh, network is is going to be an appropriate application of this control. And so where multi-factor authentication might not be possible, consider alternate controls like jump hosts with focus monitoring. Um, the focus should really be placed on those connections in and out of the OT network and not on connections within the network. And, and kind of on that note, you're obviously not gonna put multi-factor authentication on an HMI, right? Um, there's a there's a limited scope where uh, this control applies, but where it does apply, it is absolutely critical. Um, so, cool, thanks, and and really helpful to know, you know, just kind of where to apply it and and not um, because you know if you as we've said in the past, right, and and cite in the white paper as well. If you just copy and paste your IT uh, cybersecurity strategy right into OT, um, you could uh, you could end up with some problems. I thought that was a great example about the HMI. Okay, so uh, the fifth and final control, uh, having a vulnerability management program. So Nick, walk us through that and um, and, and what that means, um, and uh, and and how um, you know some pharmaceutical organizations uh, you know, have implemented it. Yeah, fantastic. So um, this builds on two previous controls: defensible architecture and OT visibility. Um, without that asset inventory of having the main attributes of a make model version of firmware, you don't really know what you're vulnerable to. Um, so if you have those three different attributes, you can say with pretty high confidence when Rockwell or Siemens or Schneider Electric releases a vulnerability um, notification that you can match it up and then do a determination of how am I impacted by this. Um, so if you look at the various different things you can do once you know if you have a vulnerability that's applicable to your, your asset inventory is look at how do I either um, evaluate and accept risk for this vulnerability um, is this something that I can either remediate or mitigate? Um, as you know, in pharmaceutical, um, you know, it's tough to just shut things down and then go apply a firmware update to remediate a vulnerability. Um, you know, sometimes that will trigger a validation for a control system to see if there's any change that could occur um, to affect the product that I'm making and releasing to market. Um, so there are, you know, different mitigation guidance that can be provided, um, whether it's restricting access to port services or um, you know, different communication patterns um, to those assets to mitigate a vulnerability. Um, OT being a little bit different, of course, there's uh, additional controls where you actually go to the controller, the PLC, 
and change the key switch on the front to change the mode. Um, often control systems, a lot of controls engineers will leave them in a remote mode um, where there's been some new vulnerabilities over the last couple of years that actually can be mitigated uh, by switching that key switch to run. Um, the amount of control panels I've been in that I've seen that key switch just sitting there, um, you know, obviously remote access and remote management of a device makes it really easy to maintain, go online and monitor with. Um, but sometimes mitigation of these vulnerabilities can be just simply by changing that switch over. Um, so really knowing the vulnerabilities, having a plan to only manage them and address them, but also measure how you're doing over time too. Um, you know, just looking at remediation for the sake of remediation, that might impact operations. Maybe there's vulnerabilities out there that you can prioritize with a now next maintenance window or never if it's something that, you know, I need to be hands on keyboard on the device to actually, um, you know, uh, take advantage of the vulnerability um, to get access to the device. That doesn't really make sense for me to spend a lot of time remediating that vulnerability, uh, but at least I can have the visibility to what is out there. Um, you know, when you look at OT vulnerabilities, some of these things affect operations. Um, I've seen vulnerabilities where you have a memory leak in an Ethernet card that would just drop the card off the network. Obviously, if I lose communications, it might shut down my process or my packaging line. Um, you know, those are different things to look at. What's the security and operational impact that could affect people, uh, safety and product safety? Awesome. Thanks, Nick. So that brings us to uh, the uh, end of our discussion of the five critical controls. Um, and, and at this point, uh, we'd be happy to take any live questions um, from the audience. Let's just give a couple minutes to um, see those come in. And I know you can just type them into the question box and they'll, they'll come to us. So here's Here's one that's coming in. I, you know, I think we we covered um, uh, a bit earlier, and I'm interested to kind of dive a little deeper. Um, I'm under budget constraints and can't cover all of my sites. How should we prioritize? Maybe Nick, you could take that one. Yeah, it's a great question, and I think um, what I said before was really applicable with looking at what does a bad day look like and what is like the big boom factor um, across my enterprise. And you start grouping sites by criticality. What's the business impact? Um, if I start mapping um, downstream or upstream processes, maybe I have a facility that's feeding another facility that, of course, can create bottlenecks in my production schedule to meet my deadlines and what I'm looking to produce. Um, so you can start grouping sites by criticality and impact that if you were to lose them, what is the impact to my overall business? What is the financial loss or production loss? Um, and how does that affect my supply chain? Um, so if you start grouping sites and then looking at how I apply my set of controls across those sites, um, you know, I, I like to kind of divert away from the let's do one control at all sites. Let's try to get a subset of our most critical sites to get the most coverage of controls. So if I can do five controls at 15 sites to start and then figure out what that plan looks like over the next uh, two to three, maybe five years, um, that's where I would look at, you know, spreading out my controls and prioritizing. Great. Uh, we have another couple questions coming in. So um, what's the quickest and easiest way to develop an incident response plan? Is there a template that we can follow? And maybe Seth, if you want to take a, take a shot at that one. Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, I, I think it is not necessarily about having uh, a template you can follow, right? Because we've talked a lot about how each of these environments is going to be subtly different, right? But uh, having people who have worked to develop these plans previously and can kind of ask the right questions, a lot of it is getting everybody in the same room, again, talking about that alignment of your IT security team, your OT security team, uh, and your executive team having everybody in a room and um, asking the right questions, right, helps uh, step that process off on the right foot and make sure uh, that you are building a plan that um, is responsive to both the needs and concerns of your specific uh, environment, but then also your, your specific uh, business use case, and then uh, kind of your your crown jewels, right, it is focused on project, protecting whatever you consider to be um, you know, the most critical processes uh, within within your organization. So I'd, I'd say that it's a lot less about um, you know templates and more about uh, having a partner who can help uh, guide you through asking the right questions. 
Cool. Thanks, Seth. Yeah, and I've I've said um, you know when I've been asked for advice, you know, pick a pick your favorite standard, right? But then make sure that you've kind of customized for your environment. And I, I think that uh, you cover that really well. So, a couple other questions. Um, the first one um, is on uh, MFA, multi-factor authentication. So the question is, does your MFA solution interoperate with a variety of biometric? Uh, card readers for the on-prem, um, you know, plant-based. So I, I guess maybe we can just cover that. Is that you know, Dragos doesn't offer an MFA solution. It's it's a control, um, you know, that we recommend um, that you would uh, implement in in your um, environment. Um, but Nick, I'm wondering if you have experience with um, you know, kind of tying in biometrics on the plant floor mm -hmm. and you know, best, best practices around that and when, when to do it and, and not do it. Um, and, uh, you know, also how much it contributes to like a better cybersecurity posture. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I have seen where there are um, solutions that do have biometric or card readers for on-prem. Um, I think Seth kind of mentioned that, you know, typically you don't see a lot of those on HMIs on the plat floor. Um, but I have seen solutions where you have like think clients, for example, or virtual desktop infrastructure on the plant floor that you might need to just authenticate to get a certain screen um, or access to certain controls on the screen. Um, so to get that elevated access, I've seen where there are biometrics on the plant floor that you can walk up, use your card, um, to gain access to that or a little key fob type of thing. I've also seen where, you know, you have fingerprints. Now, those aren't necessarily um, the greatest, depending on the environment. Obviously, um, that can change depending on if you are wearing certain uh, personal protective equipment um, that doesn't have access to your fingerprint. Um, I find that most customers that I've seen do have card readers. Um, but again, I just want to reiterate that Dragos doesn't have a MFA solution. Um, you know, that's just a control that we were talking about in general that we highly suggest people implement. Awesome. Thanks. Um, the next one, what about reactive controls? So examples, business continuity, disaster recovery, crisis management. How do you see these measures in the pharma and ICS OT uh, environments? Maybe uh, Nick, you can take that and Seth, uh, feel free to jump in as well to get some thoughts. Or actually, I can I can kick it over to uh, to you, Seth. I think you may um, you know have. Uh... Yeah. No. Absolutely. So um, you know this this kind of I think nests under the conversation about um, you know, the incident response planning, and so I, I think with with these examples, what you're talking about is like after you have um, you know, reacted to the incident itself, what does your recovery plan look like, right? And um, I, I think a lot of the exact same caveats that we've been discussing around you know, your your initial incident response apply here, right? And, and it's talking about um, those crown jewel assets and and in the event of a really bad day where those are down, you know, what do you prioritize um, in terms of uh, what are you going to focus on bringing back up first? Um, you know, in the event of ransomware, what are you going to focus on? Um, protecting and then um, how are you going to uh, respond to that incident um, in a way that allows you uh, to quickly restore critical functions, um, even if you don't have the bandwidth to kind of uh, restore functions across the line. So I think kind of my take would be is, is that in all of these, you know, business continuity and disaster recovery, crisis management, uh, you're kind of talking about the next step beyond that initial initial incident response. Um, and you know, in the event of something that has, has kind of like taken down your, your IT network uh, or even portions of your OT network, uh, how do you maintain uh, that critical base level of operations that is going to keep those crown jewel assets up? Yeah, and I'll yeah, tack on to that too. Um, you know, if you look at um, critical functions, like Seth said, um, can I actually run manually and you know get by with uh, manual r data records versus digital records that I might be using and, and needing to, to supply for regulatory purposes? Um, you know, evaluation, looking at what is the the process and like how I can actually recover and possibly um, get to some level of critical functions to still produce um, and meet my regulations. Um, you know, that's just looking at how can I actually recover 
when it comes to triggering that instant response plan. Um, disaster recovery, of course, like those are different things that I would consider as part of defensible architecture for um, you know how I develop my policies procedures and how can I have uh, a disaster recovery strategy to support an incident response capability. Yeah, I appreciate the, the detailed answers, guys. And yeah, I, I would take away from that as well. Is really the focus should be on when does the, you know, once your incident response plan is activated, right? Like what what's your um, sort of transition, right? To those other things like your DR plan and, and other things and how do they, you know, what, what are sort of the process, um, uh, you know, interconnections, right? Between your IR plan and those other types of uh, reactive controls. So. Why don't we leave it there since we're um, nearing the end of our time. Uh, we really appreciate everybody um, attending today um, and uh, listening to our discussion around the five um, critical controls. And uh, we hope you have a great uh, rest of the day and rest of the week. Thanks. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Beth, and thank you, Nick, for that thorough presentation. Uh, and just one final reminder to the audience to please participate in the survey and let us know your thoughts on this presentation um, that you'll see on your screen shortly. These answers are appreciated and they help us craft future events. Another reminder that the webcast will be available on demand shortly at our site, farmmanufacturing.com. And on behalf of Farm Manufacturing and the folks over at Dracos, Thank you so much for your attendance, and we hope you have a nice day.